Good evening all. I welcome you all on the behalf of Study IQ IS English. My name is Pritesh Mathurkar. I welcome you all to this exciting journey entitled Geography through Maps, wherein I, as your friend, philosopher, guide, and mentor, will be taking you all on a world tour, wherein you and me will study the physiography of Earth, where you and me will understand the topography of Earth, wherein you and me. will try to analyze the planet by using the most potent tool in geography that is maps guys geography as a discipline is a very modern day discipline it is heavily reliant on some of the most important tools and the most important tool in geography is maps because maps will do what maps will help you understand those locations wherein you can travel through actuality you have to analyze any location so as to assess its impact on the local ecology so as to assess its geopolitical geo strategic significance and that is why this journey is very fantastic this journey is very eye opening rather this journey is enlightening through this journey guys i wish that each and every one of you understands our planet develops a liking for our planet and in general has that thought has that kind of love for our planet wherein you and me can both appreciate the beauty of this planet so academic wise these curriculums this being the 13th lecture of this series through this curriculum i wish that each and every one of you will score at least 10 to 20 marks in your prelims and at least 100 to 200 marks in your mains and if essay comes in your purview if some other thing comes in the purview of atlas this can very well shoot up up to 300 to 400 marks too so i will be analyzing maps from utilitarian perspective wherein we will use the direct knowledge of maps to assess current affairs too so guys those of you who are watching me for the first time i welcome you all on this journey those of you who are watching me through days So you all know the workflow. Those of you who are joining me, I will again quickly repeat my workflow. My workflow is that in any day's lecture, I tend to revise whatever we did in the previous lecture in just five to ten minutes. After that, I introduce you to new topics, and thereafter we see its applicability on the world atlas. So the same thing will continue for at least five to ten more lectures, wherein I think. what information is necessary for you all for understanding the physiography of earth i will be sharing first so up till now i discussed majority of the information with you all with regards to the earth's climate the atmosphere so today i will be moving into the discussion of the earth's land surface whatever topics i feel are important from the lithosphere perspective from the earth's land surface perspective wherein you and me are both sitting so that topics i will cover up then slowly we'll move into the hydrosphere so once all of these three spheres are interlinked we will understand the correlation of this three spheres as biosphere and then we will start doing the detailed analysis of maps per se wherein we will also crunch in industry we will also crunch in economy we will also crunch in history and society so a wholesome curriculum for you all and through this curriculum guys you will be able to score roughly 300 to 400 marks in mains including your essays and roughly 10 to 20 marks in your prelims directly and if the examination is more ecology centric more environment centric then that uh, scoring can go way ahead and through this curriculum guys you will be very easy be able to cover up roughly 50 to 60% of your gs geography main syllabus as well as gs geography syllabus of prelims and using this curriculum you will be able to get the advanced concepts too so please treat this curriculum as the launch bed or as the test bed for your main preparation and you and i will move in the same direction step by step so please treat me as your friend please treat me as your philosopher mentor and guide whichever difficulties come in the pathway i will be there for you all okay so i am providing you this free guided world tour so welcome board on the journey so as i promised good evening siddesh 
So as I promised guys that every lecture will begin with a beautiful picture of whatever I covered in the last class. So in the last class I did introduce you to moisture, humidity and precipitation. So the beautiful image which you are seeing on the board over here is actually a very recent image. This image is in the month of February of 2023. So if you can see over here you can see the desert soils, the light brown color and in this desert soils you are having snow so basically this is the image of sahara of algeria and wherein you are having snowfall okay so snowfall in sahara is not that uncommon it has normally snowed for approximately five times in the last 50 years this year including so if you see the beautiful image okay you will see the desert soils you will see snow and there are no trees basically so the only tree you are seeing are this small small xerophytic trees small bushes cacti rest you will feel that as though this topography is upwards of 66 and half degrees north you will feel sir this is lapland but no guys this is not lapland this is sahara so earth has got such beautiful topographies and why do we have rainfall in sahara for that you need to understand the position of the sahara with respect to the andes so when we will do the detailed analysis of African continent, these things will be clear to you. Okay. So before I begin, I will likely like to introduce myself again. My name is Pritesh Maturkar. I will be your primarily faculty for handling the GS part of geography. And if things move ahead, we will be also dealing with the options too. So you can reach out to me on Telegram. The name of the channel being Geography by Pritesh Maturkar. Okay, you can reach out to me on this channel by doing a global search at Geography by Pritesh on your Telegram. So in this channel guys, I normally post one link, one PDF or one video in roughly one or two days. So in a month, you won't be having more than 20 to 25 entries. I am not a faculty who believes in crunching as much information as possible because you and me will be moving together. So. Please join this channel if you want to have the most relevant discussions that are happening in the field of geography, in the field of environment and in the field of ecology. So whatever information you will get in this channel, roughly 80% of it will translate into your mains and prelims. So it, it is in your best interest and also in my best interest that we have this quality assurance check. If you see the products which you buy any product if you buy so there it is written qc pass so qc pass is quality control pass so any content that you are watching including my content should be quality control checked so that is my best endeavor with you all that we all do the quality control analysis from my end to and your end to. okay so before any ado let's begin with the discussion of today's lecture so before that i will likely quickly like to re-revise whatever we did in the last class so in the last class guys i did introduce you to the concept of moisture humidity and precipitation okay and in that and in that concept i introduce you to the measures of measuring moisture humidity precipitation okay so Moisture is basically the water vapor content in the atmosphere, the water vapor content in the air pocket and the concentration of this water vapor will vary from location to location. So if I consider the equatorial areas, okay, if I consider the equatorial areas, so equatorial areas will have high water vapor content, they will have high water vapor content, why they will have high water vapor content? because of direct insulation of the sun which is almost 90 degree because of this you are having intense vertical convection so the equatorial areas will have water vapor content as you move towards the tropical areas okay as you move towards the tropical areas the water vapor content will reduce why because of subtropical high pressure belt and because of high pressure conditions there is very less kind of convection upwards the sun is shining directly it is inhibited cloud formation so whatever moisture you have it directly evaporates under the scorching heat of sun so 
because of this because of less rainfall because of scanty rainfall these conditions or the air in this part of the world is very much less saturated with water vapor so equatorial regions will have water vapor content in upwards of 4 to 5 percent of the atmosphere whereas these subtropical hot deserts will have almost 0 percent of moisture if you go towards the polar areas the water vapor percentage will vary from location to location you remember we discussed fronts so those areas which are coming under the influence of fronts there you can have high water vapor content whereas if you in general go towards the poles the atmosphere will be largely dry because it being very cold it being extremely high pressure zone so this is the moisture so how can you measure this okay how can you measure so we discussed absolute humidity we discussed specific humidity absolute humidity specific humidity is basically expressed in gram per cc so the amount of moisture in one volume unit of air or the amount of moisture upon the weight of the moist air so these two measures they are not helpful for us predicting whether you will have rainfall or not whether you will have precipitation or not for you all to understand whether you will have precipitation you need to have a more accurate measure that accurate measure i gave you was the concept of relative humidity so what is relative humidity guys relative humidity is the amount of water vapor present in the air upon the moisture holding capacity of air okay moisture holding capacity of air okay moisture holding capacity of air into 100 percent so relative humidity is expressed in percentage terms so basically we are diagnosing what so if i'm holding an air pocket let's say i'm holding a cup of air pocket okay so the capacity or the moisture holding capacity of that air pocket or that cup is 500 ml and if you have water vapor saturation roughly 400 ml so will you have rainfall no why because air is not yet fully saturated the excess water vapor will not come down as rainfall so you need to now do what you need to physically add up the moisture so as to have rainfall so will rainfall occur or not that will depend upon how much the air is saturated and herein the reference of relative humidity will come in hand so if i take you to equatorial locations guys and if i give you the percentage relative humidity and it is if upwards of 80 degrees or 80 percentage not degrees 80 percentage on the equatorial areas it will indicate what that you will have high chances of precipitation why because already the air is saturated you are in the equatorial areas so but naturally you are going to have precipitation but if I take you tropical areas, if I take you the, the subtropical hot deserts, what is happening in the deserts guys? The evaporation rate is very high. The air is very much less saturated with water vapor. Even though you have the air saturated with water vapor more than 50%, if the relative humidity is let's say 70%, even then there are very less chances of rainfall. Why? Because of continuous evaporation, because of the high pressure conditions. So. In subtropical hot deserts, first of all, you won't find relative humidity in upwards of 60 to 70 percentage. And even if you find this kind of relative humidity in the subtropical hot deserts, it's very difficult to have precipitation. So the chances are very less for such kind of thing. So the two things I opined in the last class, which you should consider for having rainfall or not. So the first thing should be that you should consider the latitude of a place then you should consider the relative humidity of that particular place so if you open up the google weather in your phones guys let it be android or let it be ios so if i'm asking you a very plain simple question that those who are watching me sidesh if i'm asking you that will you have rainfall in your area so first of all you will assess in which area you are which latitude you are and then you will see the relative humidity percentage so whether you should carry an umbrella or not it will depend on what it will depend on the relative humidity and the your latitude so these two things you need to check so if i'm considering the equatorial areas but naturally you will have to carry an umbrella if i'm considering the subtropical hot deserts no if i'm considering the polar areas may or may not be 
southern hemisphere not of any consequence there is no land per se so we answered the question that whether you will have rainfall or not but how can you have rainfall how does rainfall occur in the first place itself so for that guys i introduced you to two things that for you all to have rainfall you have two options what are those options guys the first option being that you physically add up the moisture you add moisture physically you all moisture physically so you have a cup of air packet and in that you are continuously adding so 500 ml is the saturation or is the capacity of the air pocket and you have added 600 ml the excess 100 ml will come down as what it will come down as rain or the second option is that instead of physical addition you do what you reduce the moisture holding capacity you reduce the moisture holding capacity of the air pack so if you reduce the moisture holding capacity of the air pocket you can achieve this by how you can achieve this by lowering the temperature or by condensing the air pocket so if you condense the air packet if you lower the temperature of air pocket cold air will not hold a high amount of moisture warm air it being expanding it will hold more amount of moisture whereas cold air is not that sufficient in holding the moisture so as you start condensing the air pocket its capacity to hold moisture will decrease so now if you start condensing the air its capacity is decreasing so even if the air pocket is less saturated with water vapor you can have rainfall why because you have decreased the moisture holding capacity of the air pocket through cooling the air packet so again the same example 500 ml cup the moisture in that cup is roughly 400 ml can you have rainfall no sir no madam so now what we are doing we are reducing the capacity the moisture holding capacity from 500 to let's say 300 ml why how by lowering the temperature so as soon as you lower the temperature of the air packet for the same amount of saturation that is 400 ml you are now new capacity is 300 ml so the excess 100 ml will come down as so this is how you will have occurrence of rainfall and i did discuss guys that rainfall you can have the rainfall in different forms the water vapor can condense and can come down in different forms so you can have rainfall you can have snowfall you can have hailstones you can have glaze you can have sleet okay okay so these three or five forms types you will have variations globally so this is what i discussed in the yesterday's class with regards to moisture precipitation and humidity so this knowledge was very much needed for you all to understand the local ecology of a place where we will put it to use as we move ahead with the discussions of the atlas entry so now guys let us move ahead let us take our discussions even further now now enough of air enough of that atmosphere enough of the latitudes now let us divert our attention to the earth's land surface those who are watching me for the first time today or those who will watch me for the first time today as per your convenience guys it's my humble request that this being the 13th lecture please revise the previous lectures okay in any lecture i tend to introduce you to new concepts for roughly 20 to 30 minutes so revision of the past 30 lectures will not be that difficult for you all please do this because this will serve as the foundational basis for your geography discipline and also for environment and ecology mind you guys civil services examination is ever evolving okay it is becoming more and more analytical dare i say don't get frightened this being an open platform it is actually becoming difficult i am not frightening you guys i am not threatening you but it is becoming little bit difficult difficult for whom those who don't see this discipline the way it is need to be seen okay see geography is a very beautiful discipline you need to understand the intricacies of it once you start enjoying this then there is nothing for you who is stopping for scoring good marks so just enjoy it guys okay and if you are not enjoying even if after getting such a good guide you are not able to enjoy so 
do force enjoyment because it's the philosophy of life things which you can't change you have to start enjoying okay so please remember this as my golden words things which you cannot change in life start enjoying them so you have to prepare geography you have to prepare environment and ecology it will be my ultimate effort that i wish that each and every one of you should enjoy this discipline but if somehow you are still not able to watch so do it do forced enjoyment okay that's a philosophy of life jokes aside now let's move ahead with the discussion of the earth's land surface so from today onwards guys i will be focusing majorly on the lithospheric parts again i will be using the knowledge of the 11th ncrts and the book entitled certificate physical and human geography by gonchang leon and i will keep on adding some of the advanced level concepts too and some of the current affairs too as and when i need so bear with me let's start the beautiful journey of analyzing the land surface that we have okay so guys the way you are seeing the world on your screens now okay so if you see this you will say sir these are the continents so you have north america you have south america you have the great continent of africa you have europe you have russia or eurasia you have the continent of asia so asia will also include russia you have the continent of australia and you have the continent of antarctica so if i'm painting a picture of the earth's land surface for you all so in totality we'll say that there are seven major continents okay out of this the biggest continent is that of asia okay so the asian continent will be the biggest continent of all okay if you see on this atlas the way you are seeing on the board you will see that the size of africa is comparable to north america or south america but in practicality guys africa holds for approximately 20% of world's land area okay the projection which we are using okay projection means the way you are seeing this on this digital board this projection is not that good why we are using this projection so that you understand the world atlas easily but if you use proper projection tools if you use proper cartographic tools africa will account for roughly 20% of world's land area so what you are seeing actually is a distorted world map this has been distorted for your practical understanding so please get this okay so territorially speaking asia is the world's largest landmass australia okay australia is the world's largest island continent it's surrounded by sea on all four sides okay the map which you are seeing on the board over here is not the same or was not the same as when the earth formed okay earth has got its own geological history the land surface which you are all sitting the land surface on which i am standing and taking this discourse was not the same as when the earth was formed okay earth has gone through series of tectonic changes earth has gone through series of geological upheavals to form the present day structure of the continents the continents which you are seeing today rather the position of the continents which you are seeing today was not the same as when the earth was formed rather these continents were not at all existing when the earth was formed okay so now let us divert our attention let us move towards understanding of the origin of earth for a moment so we will try to assess how earth form will try to assess the primitive nature of the earth's land surface and how do you have evolution from that land surface to present day land surface and then we will try to analyze the present day land surface via its rocks via its minerals okay the present status of mountain ranges their evolvement so this is how we will move through in understanding of earth per se those who are watching me feel free to comment that you are getting whatever i am saying and those who will watch me in the next sessions or those will watching me as per their convenience i am a very receptive faculty guys so even if you comment in the chat box there after watching the lectures your suggestions will be most welcome but mind you i am been adamant since day one that this sessions will somewhat become intense in due course of time so guys it's your humble responsibility that you are also flaring with me 
and those of you who are really genuine civil servant aspirants they will stick with me for eternity that's my promise and i will not leave your side ever okay it's just like tata sky if you stick with me your life will become jinga lala okay <laughs> so jokes aside let's move ahead so now let us understand a little bit with regards to the evolution of earth with regards to the formation of earth and how earth evolved and basically the present day structure of the continents so now let us understand first the origin of universe and the origin of earth per se okay so if i take you to a journey wherein we are trying to print in the origin of universe the origin of earth so the most acceptable theory in the origin in the origin of universe in the origin of universe or the earth per se or the earth per se okay it is called as anybody free to comment okay those of you are watching me you can comment the most acceptable theory in the origin of earth is the big bang theory is the big bang theory okay what do you mean by this theory guys what do you mean by big bang okay so the nef itself suggests that there was something big and there was something bang okay bang means a big impact okay so what is this theory this theory was given in the year 1912 okay okay so early 1920s by a person called as george lemaitre okay george lemaitre okay by a person called as george lemaitre and you have various contributions to this theory so the most notable contributions being the contribution of albert einstein the contributions of stephen hawking but the first conceptual idea of the big bang was given in the year 1912 by a person called as george lemaitre what did this person opine this person opined that the universe began from a singularity it began from a single dimensionless entity so if i'm considering this single dot on your digital board as a single dimensionless entity okay so this is single dimension dimension <clears throat> less dimension less entity okay dimension less entity and this entity will have what this entity will have infinite mass this entity will have infinite mass and this entity will have infinite gravity too okay nothing can escape out of it this dimensionless entity is having infinite mass infinite gravity and this single entity is now undergoing sudden cosmic expansion it is undergoing what it is undergoing sudden cosmic expansion so what is happening in this is that this singular entity is having sudden cosmic expansion okay so if i'm drawing you on the board like this so let us stretch this <clears throat> Let's use this board to its proper potential. let us start to appreciate this so this singular entity is having what it is having sudden cosmic expansion so if i'm drawing this entity again so from this singular dimensionless entity you are having a sudden cosmic expansion you are having a sudden cosmic inflation you have a sudden cosmic inflation okay so from this 
singularity or from this singular entity you have cosmic dust being thrown out you have celestial bodies being thrown out and as they are thrown out as the bodies are thrown out these bodies will coalesce these bodies will fuse together to form the earliest of galaxies to form the earliest of solar systems and the earliest of stars and the planets so this is basically the concept behind big bang theory that you have one singular dimensionless entity with infinite mass with infinite gravity from this the cosmic dust is suddenly thrown out and as you move ahead from this singularity so this is with regards to the dimension of time so if i'm drawing it on a graph so the scale which you will see on the board over here will be time so the time when big bang began it is called as time zero why this is called as time zero because before big bang there was no universe before big bang even time was not existing okay so if i take you to big bang and if i take you back from big bang you don't know what is there why because before big bang even time is not existing and the most notable contributions to these have been given by Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking. So, theory of relativity of Albert Einstein. Okay, that time is not constant, rather, guys, time is relative. So, before this, you don't have time. So, whatever measurement of time that you have is after this. So, the universe began from this singularity, and the Big Bang is roughly. The time scale of Big Bang, when Big Bang happened, so it is roughly between 13.6 billion years to 15 billion years ago. To 15 billion years ago. So roughly 13.6 to 15 billion years ago, Big Bang happened. From this, you had the cosmic dust, you had the celestial bodies being thrown out these bodies they started condensing these bodies they start coalescing to form the earliest of planets to form the earliest of stars to form the earliest of galaxies and the earliest of clusters okay so whenever cosmic dust whenever cosmic bodies will be thrown out so but naturally the earliest gases will be thrown out will be the lightest of gases and you all know periodic table will start from the lightest of gases called as hydrogen and helium so guys that is the same thing which happened with earth too okay so big bang happened roughly 13.6 to 15 billion years ago so the origin of earth is roughly attributed to around 3.8 to 4.5 billion years ago that is the time scale of the origin of earth okay so roughly 10 billion years after the formation of universe after the beginning of universe you have the formation of earth and guys those who are listening to me please treat this information with utmost respect please treat the words that are coming from my mouth with utmost dignity you all are living in a very prestigious times you all are living in very fantastic times why now we have precise instruments for measuring all of this for documenting all of this okay so Recently, we have launched the world's most advanced telescope, rather the most costliest experiment known to mankind, the James Webb Telescope, to see whether this Big Bang has actually happened or not. And James Webb Telescope has basically painted the same picture to us. James Webb Telescope has actually given us the pictures of galaxies which are formed roughly 12 to 13 billion years ago. So now we have pictures of those celestial bodies, of those galaxies, which can be touted as the origin of universe. So now we have such technology that we can see that how everything began in the first place. So you are all are living in very prestigious times. You should be extremely proud that where humanity has come. Okay, we came from chimpanzees, we came from the apes, and today we are able to assess our position in the universe so today we are able to assess our position in the universe so this is how the evolution of universe is so the origin of universe is roughly 13.6 to 15 billion years ago 
and the origin of earth is roughly 3.8 to uh, roughly 4.5 billion years ago and the theory being big bang theory everything started from a single dimensionless entity with infinite mass with infinite gravity prior to it even time did not exist okay so just for your uh, sake of understanding just for increasing your curiosity so a book i am recommending to you all for the first time through this lectures and the name of the book is brief answers to big questions by stephen hawking okay it was the last book ever written by stephen hawking so in that book he has answered eight questions like as to how did everything began do you believe in god or what what was there before the beginning of universe so just read that book it will increase your curiosity for understanding the earth as well okay so please remember guys that the origin of earth and the origin of universe is attributed to a theory called as the big bang theory and in big bang theory everything began from a singular dimensionless entity with infinite mass with infinite gravity from which the cosmic dust from which the cosmic bodies were thrown out they coalesced they condensed to form the present day part of the universe okay and you all know the lightest of elements will be hydrogen and helium so everywhere if you go in the universe where you find big clusters of stars there you have big nebulas nebulas are basically massive amorphous clouds of hydrogen and helium which are condensing so similar thing happened with earth too okay so now let us move ahead let us understand the origin of earth let us understand how everything began and what is the present status of earth per se okay so if i now consider the planet earth okay so the planet earth basically originated from a very primitive state it basically originated from the lightest of gases like hydrogen and helium so if i'm considering the origin of earth okay so the origin of earth can be roughly attributed to around 3.8 to 4.5 billion years ago billion years ago and the most acceptable theory for this is the big bang theory okay guys see geography is a ever evolving discipline my knowledge or rather the world knowledge is based on present day understanding of the universe using present day technology it might happen guys that 100 years from now 200 years from now we will have some another important discovery why because technology is evolving so as technology evolves our understanding of the world also evolves so it might happen guys that big bang theory will become irrelevant in 100 years or 200 years so then new theory will come my understanding of universe your understanding of universe rather in the present day understanding of universe of majority of the world scientists majority of the world geographers historians okay everyone is based on this theory only okay so the big bang theory okay so earth was nothing as we see today earth was basically a coalition of the lightest of gases like hydrogen and helium so earth was basically a giant giant amorphous amorphous cloud giant amorphous cloud of the lightest of elements like hydrogen and helium okay these elements these elements they start what they start coalescing they start condensing and they start accreting so you have accretion you have accretion of these elements wherein these elements start fusing together okay so as elements start to fuse together you have formation of new elements so you move from lighter elements to heavier elements okay and as these elements fuse the earth slowly starts to take shape okay so the most uh important theory with regards to the origin of earth in consonance with the big bang theory 
in consonance with the big bang theory the name of the theory is the nebular accretion process so if you want to understand the present day status of earth so in consonance with big bang we also need to study the nebular accretion theory the name of the theory guys it is called as the nebular accretion theory what do you mean by nebular accretion theory nebular accretion theory okay so this theory will give you answer as to what is the present day status of earth and why earth is still called as a planet which is still solidifying which is still condensing so nebular accretion theory states that earth basically was formed out of the coalition out of the condensation or accretion of the lightest of elements like hydrogen and helium these elements they started to spin this giant amorphous cloud they all started to spin as they started to spin okay the process of coalition the process of coalition and accretion okay process of coalition and accretion began okay the process of coalition and accretion began okay so you have what you have basically a giant cloud of hydrogen and helium this giant cloud of hydrogen and helium it starts to spin it starts to swirl because of the gravity of the sun because of the gravitational forces of the universe and as this starts to churn the lighter elements they start fusing together to form bigger elements and as the mass increases as the density increases the earth's structure comes into play the earth's land surface comes into play so as this starts to form as this gases starts to swirl so in the earth's interior you will have the heaviest of elements whereas as you move away from the interiors of the earth you will have lighter elements so this is nothing but the nebular accretion process wherein the gases they start to swirl they start to coalesce they start to accrete because of this as this starts to swirl the innermost layers of earth have will have very much high density whereas as you come out of the inner interiors of the earth towards the land surface the density will decrease and the atmosphere will have the lightest of gases which will then escape so it is basically like this if i am drawing a very crude diagram of the nebular accretion process okay so you will have a very giant amorphous cloud like this okay of lightest of gases okay this cloud will start to swirl this start cloud will start to coalesce as this cloud starts to swirl as this stout cloud starts to coalesce okay the lighter elements will form on the surface whereas the denser elements will be formed inside this body the density being high the elements will fuse together into interiors and as you move out of the interiors you will have what you will have progressive layering of lighter elements so from this as this starts to swirl as this amorphous cloud starts to lose heat so in the interiors or in the lightest of interiors you will have the heaviest of elements you will have heaviest of elements interiors and as you move out of the interiors towards the outer layers these outer layers will have the lightest of elements you will have the lightest of elements so you all know the earth is rotating you all know the earth is spinning on its axis the earth is still in motion indicating what that the nebular accretion the accretion of this hot dense nebula okay we are considering the formation of earth okay these gases were very hot they started to swirl they started to swing and this process is still ongoing the nebular accretion process of earth guys is still ongoing don't forget this hence today the earth's core is spinning you have the outer core and you have the inner core the outer core is spinning inside the earth indicating what the earth's nebular accretion is still going on 
So if I'm trying to paint a picture of what is nebular accretion, nebular accretion is nothing but the process where the heaviest of elements coalesced into the innermost layers and as you move out, as you move out, the density of the elements decreases. As you move out, the density of the elements decreases. So if I paint a picture of the primitive earth and of the present day earth, so let us paint a picture of primitive earth versus present day earth. Let us do a crisscross comparison. Okay. So for that, let us use some of the geometrical tools that we have. Okay. So I'm dividing the digital board into two parts. Okay. So this is the primitive earth. This is the primitive earth. Okay. And this is the present earth, the earth which you see today. Okay. Present day earth. Okay. So if I'm showing diagrammatically, the primitive earth was nothing but a giant amorphous cloud of the gases like hydrogen and helium. These gases started to swirl around them. So this being hot, dense, hot dense nebula okay hot dense nebula this nebula it starts to swirl it starts to swirl it starts to accrete okay it starts the nebular accretion okay it starts coalescing it starts coalescing okay as it starts to coalesce as it starts to accrete so from this process you have the present day earth wherein you have what you have concentric lining of elements i'm again reiterating guys you have what you have concentric lining of elements so you have concentric you have concentric trick lining lining of elements you have concentric lining of elements what do you mean by this so if i'm drawing the present day earth shape for you all okay so the present day earth shape is like this so this is the innermost core this is the outermost core <clears throat> okay so from this to this so you have nebular accretion you have swirling of the nebulas from this part to this part you have concentric lining of elements so the innermost core of earth will have the heaviest of elements will have the heaviest of elements and as you move out from the interiors towards the surface the density will decrease the density will decrease so on the surface you will have the lightest you will have the lightest of sediments or the lightest of elements and if you go in the atmosphere it will be rich in gases but mind you the earliest atmosphere was rich in gases like hydrogen and helium so as these gases were very light as these gases were extremely expanding these gases escaped so the gases which you have today in the atmosphere like nitrogen oxygen they are again the product of millions of years of evolution of the atmosphere and the formation of biological processes on earth like respiration and photosynthesis so guys this is the primitive earth and this is the present day earth and mind you and mind you please this is very important the coalition or the nebular accretion of earth is still ongoing earth is not yet cooled so if i am painting the picture for you all if i am painting the picture for you all so 
द अर्थ द अर्थ इज नॉट येट कूल्ड ओके द अर्थ नेबुलर एक्रिएशन द अर्थ नेबुलर एक्रिएशन द अर्थ नेबुलर एक्रिएशन इज स्टिल ऑन गोइंग इज स्टिल ऑन गोइंग इज स्टिल ऑन गोइंग इंडिकेटिंग वॉट indicating what that you do have earth's own heat source so as you move inside the earth the temperatures are bound to increase so if you are moving from surface if you move from the surface towards the interiors of earth towards the interiors of earth both temperature and pressure will increase why because earth's nebular accretion is still ongoing whereas if you go to mars the nebular accretion has stopped so mars is basically a dead planet so for you all to colonize the mars for me to colonize the mars we will require what we will require terraforming of mars so somehow we need to reactivate the core of mars so if you want to live on mars like we live on earth something needs to be done we need to terraform mars we need to start spinning of the core again otherwise it's very difficult for us to have this and because of this nebular accretion because of the earth spinning of outer core with respect to the inner core you have the formation of exosphere of the earth you have the formation of magnetosphere and this magnetosphere is very vital for you and me surviving on this planet why because this magnetosphere does what it protects us from the harmful gamma rays and x rays of the sun and the same thing you cannot do on mars so on mars if you wish to survive without any costume without any space suit you need to terraform the mars so that it starts spinning again it is a living breathing planet again and we all can survive so earth is still cooling the nebular accretion process of earth is still ongoing and you have earth's own internal heat source and mind you this heat source is basically what the leftover of the nebular accretion okay so if you go inside the earth you have two heat sources number first the heat source is that of nebular accretion the first heat source is that of nebular accretion nebular accretion and the second heat source and the second heat source is the radioactive decay of elements is the radio active decay of the elements so you have radioactive elements inside the earth's surface like uranium like krypton okay like thorium all of them have their shelf lives so these elements are undergoing nuclear disintegration so that are the two heat sources with regards to earth primarily so the present day earth that you see is basically the all out of the nuclear of the nebular accretion process okay so in the interiors you will have the heaviest of elements as you move out you will have the lightest of elements and the land surface which you see today the land surface was not the same as it was before before it was a very primitive land surface very thin crust the crust which you see today has again gone through evolution of millions and millions of years per se so tomorrow's class we will discuss the evolution of earth's crust we will try to apply that knowledge in our understanding of atlas so tomorrow will be the first class when we will start discussions of mountain ranges wherein i will take you on a world tour of different mountain ranges their orogeny and their time scale of upliftment okay so tomorrow's class becomes very very paramount guys please understand this concept of nebular accretion we will apply this concept tomorrow and tomorrow onwards we will start again very heavy utilization of atlas okay so please make sure that you are comfortable with this concept so tomorrow onwards i will quickly paint you all the density of earth the structure of earth the origin of earth's crust and we'll move towards the discussions of mountain ranges so before closing it off i will again like to reintroduce myself my name is pritesh mathurkar okay 
you can all reach out to me on telegram via channel called as the geography by pritesh maturk for joining this channel you can just do a global search on telegram at geography by pritesh i will be your primary faculty for handling the current affairs of geography as well as your gs discos and again home assignment today for you all and a very good current affair and from this current affair i will begin tomorrow's session that for the first time we have discovered another layer inside earth it is called as the true inner core okay so that information i'll be sharing today on this group so this year only we have discovered another layer inside the earth indicating the true inner core which means what that inside the inner core also we are having even more denser inner core so again i told you guys geography is a ever evolving discipline and in this discipline you need to have the basis of technological innovations so the more the technology the more will be the evolution so on the behalf of study iq is english i thank each and every one of you for watching this lectures those of you who will watch me on a later date as per your convenience i sign it off for today please keep on working hard and smart and do not leave consistency that is the need of the earth so all the best to everyone see you all tomorrow sharply at 5 pm Thank you.